Thank you all for being here on a beautiful day. Hope you all survived the storms last night. Uh, it's a real privilege for me. My name is Tim Walsh. I'm the director here, for those of you who don't know me. And it's a real pleasure to welcome back an old friend and colleague. I'm going to read Dale's author's profile because I think he has a, a good sense of, of how he would like to be described. After more than 31 years as an archivist at the Hoover Presidential Library, Dale C. Meyer is enjoying a new career as an independent historical research consultant and author. After eight years as a high school and college history instructor, he joined the Washington, D.C. staff of the National Archives as an archival management intern in 1969. They were recruiting replacements for middle and upper level archival managers who were on the verge of retirement, he recently reflected. Now the process has come full circle, and it's our turn to reinvent ourselves and find new ways to enjoy historical research. When Meyer retired in early 2001, he was the principal archivist for collection management and reference services at the Hoover Library. Although Lou Henry Hoover, prototype for uh, modern first ladies, says hold up the book, <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> is his first full-length biography, Meyer is no stranger to historical research, right, uh, historical research, writing, or editing projects. At the Hoover Library, he worked with thousands of researchers and supervised the preservation and arrangement and description of personal papers of both the President and Mrs. Hoover. He has also written several scholarly articles about the former First Lady, edited a scholarly collection of essays on her life, this is called Lou Henry Hoover, Essays on a Busy Life. And uh, in, uh, and, uh, excuse me, published in 1994, and, and Oxford University Press invited him to prepare the uh, definitive uh, article on Mrs. Hoover for the highly regarded American National Biography reference work, which was published in 1999. Uh, other of his publications include Never Call Retreat, Combat Experiences of the Civil War Soldier, published in 1995, and a guide to presidential libraries holdings related to prisoners of war and missing in action published by the National Archives in 1994. Dale is married to Ruth Ann Bells, a former teacher. They have three children and five grandchildren. It says four in the book, but one was added recently, which is why they're here. <laughs> and enjoy life in the foothills of the Santa Catalina Mountains outside Tucson, Arizona. Please help me in welcoming back our good friend Dale Meyer. It is indeed a pleasure to be back here. Uh, a lot of things have changed in Iowa City, as Ruth and I discovered uh, in the last couple of hours. Uh, I uh, went over to Chicago to uh, pick up, pick her up yesterday, and uh, we came back and had a little bit of a tour of the town. Things have, uh, have changed, and I'm pleased to say I think uh, for the better, for the most part. <clears throat> in the recent years, uh, anybody who was interested in learning more about Lou Henry Hoover had to be satisfied with a few choice stories about scattered episodes in her life. And these episodes are interesting, and I could tell you a lot of them, but uh, this afternoon I'm going to try and confine myself to, uh, and I say confine myself in only maybe 40 minutes, to a very brief sketch of what this marvelous woman accomplished in her life. And these sort of things are interesting, uh, but it's uh, not a really good way to understand what a person is really like uh, if you just look at scattered parts of her life. In a way, it's kind of like trying to look at a painting by one of the French Impressionists from only two feet away. And if you've tried to look at any painting from about that distance, you know that you really don't get the full picture. And a person really needs to stand back and have more perspective. Looking at a few scattered pixels on the canvas of Lou Hoover's life is not very revealing either. And so this afternoon I'm going to attempt to provide you with a broader uh, overview from uh, a little farther back, standing a little farther back. Lou Hoover was a very poised and self-confident woman and was not overly concerned about public acclaim or whether she received the place in history that she deserved. Her lack of interest in public acclaim can perhaps be traced to her Quaker heritage and upbringing. Quakers cultivate the virtues of honesty and modesty, and Lou Hoover seems to have felt that image building and self-promotion were fundamentally dishonest. 
This, I think, helps us to understand her lack of respect for most members of the press. She was initially upset in 1900 when both she and Bert were named among the victims of the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, while it was nice for her to be able to tell people that she had survived that event, uh, nevertheless, it did cause quite a bit of uh, concern in her family. And uh, this kind of reporting caused her to question the credibility of the press in general. Similar experiences during World War I and the campaign of 1928 convinced her that the press was more interested in spreading propaganda rather than objective reporting. The Hoovers also believed that one should do their good deeds without seeking credit. So Bert and Lou practiced what I choose to call in the book, stealth philanthropy. The Hoovers always sought to, eat, to hide their various charitable good deeds. The total of their gifts to a variety of causes and individuals is still largely a mystery. However, the partial records that have survived in her papers here at the library indicate that there were many beneficiaries. The largest amounts, of course, went to Lou's pet organizations, groups that Lou had either founded or those in which she had assumed a leading role. If Lou Hoover had done more to promote her public image and allowed her charitable gifts to become common knowledge, she might have escaped the obscure position that she enjoys or occupies today. Her husband, however, made two fateful decisions that guaranteed that she would remain unknown. Shortly before his death in October 1964, Herbert Hoover told his sons to keep their mother's personal papers closed for 20 years following his death. That decision would have several unfortunate effects. Why was the closing of those papers so important? The Hoovers valued their privacy highly, but historians need access to a public figure's personal papers to understand their thoughts and motives. In Lou Hoover's case, historians had very little to work with until 1985. The situation was further complicated by the fact that in the late 1950s, the Mr. Hoover ordered her former White House secretaries to destroy some of her papers. The former president apparently wanted to protect Ms. Mrs. Hoover's memory and privacy. When he started this project in about 1959, it was commonly believed that the personal and official papers of a president were his own personal property to do with as he pleased when he left office. The Presidential Records Act, which was later passed after the Nixon scandals in the 1980s, of course, did not apply. But under these circumstances, it is almost impossible for historians to do full justice to Lou Hoover's many achievements, and this opened the door for some especially unkind remarks by some historians. Those historians who wrote before her papers were available in 1985 have tended to dismiss her as an aloof, uncaring first lady who had little compassion for the unfortunates who were trying to get through the Depression. Other complaints include their assumption that she never raised her voice to promote the cause of feminism or any other worthwhile causes. If her papers had been available in the 1960s, it's very likely that most of these comments would never have been made. Future historians, however, are still going to have a difficult time trying to set that record straight. When I began researching the book, I wondered what effect this might have on my efforts. Fortunately, my worst fears were not recognized, realized. Less than a week into my research, I began to feel much more confident when I began to find all sorts of excellent materials, particularly in the papers of her son, Alan Hoover. It was a pleasant surprise to discover that it was possible to promote accurate perspectives about this fascinating First Lady. When we examine Lou Hoover's life carefully, we realize that there are many things that we'd like to know more about. She sounds just like the sort of person we would have liked to have known, outgoing, pleasant, and fun to be around. But it's also very clear that Lou had led a very adventurous life long before she ever stepped into the White House. You realize that for many First Ladies, their years in the White House are perhaps the most exciting experience of their life. Well, for Lou Hoover, it was simply another in a long string of very adventurous experiences that she and her husband had as they traveled the world. One of the places that they visited frequently was Australia. Bert had business interests there and went there to inspect his company's mines, and Lou always accompanied him and helped him to repair, prepare his reports. Now that's important, we'll come back to that aspect in a moment. 
During their travels, Lou Hoover not only visited many exotic regions, she actually faced several serious dangers along the way, particularly during two world wars, or two major wars. One of them was World War I. About a year after they arrived in China, the Hoovers were besieged for several weeks during the Boxer Rebellion in China. During the siege, she was often shot at as she scurried about the city of Tianjin in search of food and medical supplies. She faced similar dangers in World War I when she accompanied her husband on inspection trips for the organization he founded, the Commission for Relief in Belgium. The King of Belgium's headquarters was just behind the front lines and it was constantly bombarded by German artillery. And on one of those occasions, the Hoovers were there for a dinner. She also faced the danger of submarine attacks on several occasions when she traveled to the United States during the war to see her sons. Well, these escapades, and many others, were well known to the American public before her husband's campaign for the presidency in 1928. However, by then, she was also better known for several more important accomplishments during the World War. One of the things that Hoover scholars have often wondered about is the personal relationships between the Hoovers. Well, I think uh, we know that uh, a strong partnership is the basis of every good marriage, but some relationships mature and flourish under more challenging conditions than others, and that certainly can be said of the Hoovers. They had that kind of marriage, and they constantly worked to strengthen it. And as we go through the remarks I've prepared, you'll see how this develops. One of the earliest observations of them occurred on their uh, honeymoon voyage to China. According to Frederick Palmer, a reporter who just happened to be on the ship, the Hoovers were so obviously united in purpose and comfortable with each other that no one guessed for several days that they were newlyweds. <laughs> Palmer later reported these observations in a magazine article about Lou that was published 30 years later just before Herbert Hoover's inauguration in 1929. And this article is the only eyewitness account, though, of those early weeks of their marriage. And it provides, I think, some very fascinating uh, insights into the relationship between these two uh, people. One of the more intriguing insights in this article concerns the missing correspondence that Lou Hoover and Herbert Hoover exchanged between the period when he graduated from Stanford in 1895 and their marriage in 1899. If Palmer's account is accurate, the Hoover's relationship had progressed on, by the time they boarded that steamer, uh, had progressed considerably from its uncertain state in 1895 when Bert went off to work in the California gold fields after his graduation from Stanford. Now this strikes me as a strong hint that they had exchanged many, many more letters than the ones that we have today. There are just a, one or two that had survived from that time. Um, this is particularly true, I think, after Bert got to Australia in the, uh, about August of 1897. He was fascinated by the place. He wrote a lot of amusing letters, and sometimes they had biting comments about the place, the parts that he didn't like. And he usually wrote to his friend, uh, friends back at Stanford and his brother Theodore. <clears throat> um, does anybody really seriously think that he never shared similar insights and similar observations about what he was seeing and doing in Australia? Never shared that with Lou? You can't find that sort of thing. It doesn't seem to exist. Uh, he also wrote to Lou, or to Theodore, and others in very general terms, of course, about the progress of his romance with Lou. And he never wrote to her. Uh, the references in his letters to his friends and Theodore are very discreet, but his all, two things are also very clear. One, he was scared to death of losing her. Two, he was determined not to bring her to what he described as such a hellhole as an Australian mining camp. Well, what about that critical period in Lou's junior and senior years at Stanford when she was beginning to fear that she might never become a mining engineer and never have the chance to run her own mine? Well, certainly Bert would have commiserated with her and would have suggested alternatives. I'm, I'm sure he did, but we don't have the physical evidence today. In the next several years, they would work out uh, the solution to that problem, and uh, it seems to have been agreed between them, and very likely before they got on that ship to go to China, 
that uh, she would help him with various professional aspects of his mining practice. And that is exactly what they did. The existence then of certain additional letters was also mentioned by, by Lou. In 1920, Theodore wrote to, to her. Uh, he was preparing some uh, publicity for uh, Herbert Hoover's attempt to win the uh, Republican nomination in 1920. And Lou uh, sent him a number of letters about things that had happened. And she said that there were more letters. And that's borne out by a number of things. And uh, in the interest of conserving time, I won't tell you all about that now. It's fully described in the book. But uh, she herself let the cat out of, out of the bag without knowing it when she said that there were a number of letters about their wedding arrangements and not just the one simple exchange that they allegedly or that we've always thought that they had. Two of the most damaging allegations by historians uh, are that she did not perform any significant public service activities in, during her life and that she did nothing to advance the cause of the woman's movement of her day. Now, both of these are ludicrous, they're silly, and they're easy to refute. Of course, you have to remember that earlier historians didn't have access to the materials that I had in preparing this volume. One of the interesting uh, coincidences about this, and the answer to both of these criticisms, involves a sort of lengthy uh, explanation. And it involves the social theories of a California multimillionaire. Now this fellow had made his money as a railroad tycoon, and then he turned all of his energy and a lot of his wealth to public service. His name was Leland Stanford and he is best remembered for the university that bears his name. Now, Stanford believed that America's future really depended not on captains of industry like himself, but on the efforts and the contributions of an educated working class. And so, in keeping with their determination to make a college education more affordable for these working class students, Stanford and his wife decided that tuition at their new university would be the goal was to prepare young men and women for productive roles as cultured and useful citizens who would use their education to promote the public welfare. To ensure this, the faculty was recruited from America's best universities. They included an interesting mix of seasoned veterans and promising young professors, all of whom were excited about these visionary concepts of Stanford's and all of whom were expected to transmit their enthusiasm to their students. Well, they did a good job. Another unusual feature of this new university was the inclusion of women students. Now, this is 1891, and I don't think that there were any major colleges or universities in the United States that routinely admitted men and women together. There were a number of smaller colleges that did a little bit of this, but the idea of a co-ed university was new and visionary. <clears throat> Leland Stanford insisted that, and this is a quotation from one of the early mar other, uh, remarks of his, the education of both sexes shall be equally full and complete. <laughs> As one foolish reporter had discovered a few years earlier in 1887, Leland Stanford's views on women's suffrage were even more enlightened than that, not just, uh, you know, Poet education, but women's suffrage. This reporter dredged up the old argument that women shouldn't be allowed to vote because they were much too emotional. Stanford replied that since women had to, quote, suffer the burdens of society and government, unquote, they ought to have equal rights in running both government and society. The reporter tried another approach. Well, shouldn't women be content with the fact that job opportunities were being uh, more equally available to women, and well, some of them were even becoming school principals and postmistresses. Stanford easily brushed this aside uh, with the observation that it was also true they were almost always paid half as much, and pointed out that these kinds of inequalities in pay was one of the things that was encouraging women to insist on more of a voice in the political process. So you have here a man who is really very much ahead of his times. Leland Stanford's sensible, no-nonsense approach to the issue of women's suffrage and women's rights in general had great appeal for Lou Hoover. 
or New Henry, as her name was at that moment. It would account in large part for her moderate attitudes in regard to women's suffrage and a wider range of vocational opportunities for women. Having been intellectually nourished on Stanford's guiding principles, it seemed only logical for her to assume that men would eventually listen to reason and give women the right to vote, along, as she said, with everything else they ever had wanted. Her optimistic hopes were reinforced when California actually gave women the woman that the suffrage in 1911. Lou's idealistic acceptance of Leland Stanford's uh, visionary ideas may seem a bit naive, but it did appeal to a lot of women between 1890 and 1920. In, 18, in 1920, the 20th Amendment was just a few months away from being ratified finally, when Lou gave a rare speech at Bryn Mawr College. No doubt she surprised her audience because at the beginning she stated, quote, our having the vote is a futility in itself. That we have the vote means nothing. That we use it in the right way means everything. The right way, she told her audience, must be, quote, thoughtful, idealistic, clean. She would give voice to these beliefs many times over the next 13 years. She was really far from silent on this issue. She just picked her battles and she, uh, fought for the things that really mattered. Lou was reluctant to enter the political, re re political arena during her husband's campaigns in 1928 and then again in 1932, but she felt an obligation to serve as a good example for her Girl Scouts. She could very easily have sat it out on the sidelines because most of the first other First Ladies had done exactly that. But she realized that times were changing. During the campaign, she accepted several invitations to address women's groups. This was a bit unusual, but she really broke precedent by making several short radio talks on behalf of her pre presidential candidate's campaign. Uh, this was truly a first, because you realize the first uh, broadcasts uh, commercially were in 1926. So that between 1926 and 28 is not a lot of time for radio to have developed much. But she did make several talks on radio on behalf of Burt's campaign in 1928. Well, there can be no question that Lou's experiences at Stanford would have a profound effect on her subsequent beliefs and public uh, service, and particularly women's issues in general. It was also, though, an important period in her life because she met her husband at Stanford. As it has often been assumed, their shared interest in geology and mining did provide the foundation of their relationship. However, it would be a very serious mistake to overlook the effect of the Stanford ideal, as it was sometimes called, on their shared commitment to public service in general. Their growing interest in public service also had an important influence on the development of their personal relationship. In the spring of 1893, toward the end of his sophomore year, Bert Hoover had helped to rewrite the Constitution of the Student Association as the first step in overthrowing the influence of the fraternity crowd, as they were known. A year later, he was elected treasurer of the junior class. In March 1894, he also became one of the organizers of the Barbarians, a group dedicated to reforming the inept management practices <coughs> of the fraternity crowd. The Barbarian candidates swept the student elections and Herbert Hoover became the new student body treasurer. Well, the effect on Lou was immediate because when she arrived on the campus in the fall of 1894, everyone was still talking about the coup that Hoover and the barbarians had just pulled off. A few weeks later, Bert published in the student newspaper a detailed report that uh, enumerated all the careless practices of the fraternity crowd. He also pointed out that the Student Association was $1,800 in debt as a result. By Christmas, Bert had managed to restore order and to completely eliminate the deficit. In January, the following year, another article announced that the careful management of the football team's finances under his supervision had allowed the team to show a profit. While all of this was closely reported in the student newspaper, for several weeks, and Lou's friends talked about it all the time. So it's not very difficult to see what an idealistic young woman like Lou Henry would find to respect and admire in Herbert Hoover's accomplishments as a student leader. It also helps to explain why Lou would turn to Bert Hoover in commiseration with her own problems. 
Lou had graduated with a teaching degree from San Jose State Normal in May of 1893, but she had not been able to find a position for the fall term, so she wrote to her father and asked him to put in a good word with the uh, school board in Monterey, and uh, uh, she did eventually receive several offers from uh, several other school districts in the state. However, it appears that she may have held off in making a decision for too long, for she found herself without a teaching position. And uh, she eventually went back to work with her father in the bank at Monterey, the way she had the previous year. The question remains, however, was she really unsure about teaching, or was it the possibility of working in her father's bank that was more appealing? We really don't know. But we do know that he, she later had an unpleasant uh, teaching experience the following spring in 1894. The 6th and 7th grade teacher at Monterey had suddenly eloped, and Lou was available to fill the vacancy because her classes at Stanford were already over. She looked forward to teaching geography, history, and higher math, but the school board decided that she lacked the experience to cope with the older children. She was crushed when she was left with the younger students. It was especially discouraging because she realized that her hopes for a career in bank management had apparently not been uh, encouraged by the owners of her father's bank. And so she was forced to confront the very unpleasant reality that opportunities for advancement in the future in both bank management and education would always be limited by the attitudes of unsympathetic men who were in supervisory positions above her. It was at this point that she attended a very important lecture. John C. Branner, a professor of geology at nearby Stanford, was in town. And Branner was a very popular uh, speaker who had, apparently had quite a following. Remember, you must remember in 1890s, California was still an active gold and silver mining region. <coughs> and uh, Branner gave a, a very excellent talk. Lou was fascinated by it. And afterwards, she asked him if a woman could have a meaningful career in geology. Branner assured her that it was indeed possible. But as it later turned out, he was probably thinking of an academic career as a professor in a university. Lou, on the other hand, saw geology as a way to work at something she loved in an outdoor setting. She hoped eventually to get a position as the minor, um, manager of a mine or some other professional position in mine management. Neither Branner nor Lou really seemed to have noticed the difference in their approach to this, and she went on to uh, enroll at Stanford. Later on, during the second half of her senior year in 1894, Lou would be faced with an unpleasant realization that once again she was attempting to enter a male-dominated profession. It must have been extremely discouraging. We'd like to have more letters. There probably were some that have not survived. Uh, also, uh, her parents' home in Monterey was close to the campus in, in Palo Alto. But uh, one thing I think that uh, seems quite evident is that she could have and probably did get a lot of commiseration and a lot of support from Australia, from Bert Hoover. The solution to this difficulty of hers would take several years for the Hoovers to work out, but Bert, who was deeply in love with her, was determined to make it work. The exact terms of that partnership may never be known, but it probably included an agreement that uh, she would have an interesting role in his career as his assistant and, of course, as his sounding board for uh, professional decisions. Their joint mining career probably reached its peak in the years from 1901 to 1906. Uh, that's when his career was also really going. There are some indications in her diary and in letters to her parents that they made a very effective team. For time, we could uh, detail that for you. Lou also explored other outlets for her professional training through a series of writing projects between 1899 and 1912. Before the Hoovers had left on their honeymoon journey to uh, China, Lou had decided that she wanted to do some writing about their experiences that they were about to have in China. They purchased a lot of books in bookstores in San Francisco just the day before they left, and she began accumulating additional information once they arrived in China. When Bert went off on various field trips to inspect mines, 
She visited local libraries and museums and did sightseeing on her own. Her landlady, a woman by the name of Ursula Stanley, took Lou on outings, seems to have adopted her generally, and gave her a crash course on Oriental customs and everything else that she would need to know to manage a large household with its many servants. Lou had already collected a lot of information from these different sources when the Boxer Rebellion began in the late spring of 1900. Tiansen was soon surrounded by thousands of Boxer fanatics. Now, this understandably interrupted her research, but it also introduced a new, more dramatic topic. When Tiansen was finally relieved in August, Lou was finally uh, able to leave and begin organizing her, write, her writing. Midway through her labors, however, her literary agent committed suicide. Before she could complete her historical account, there were some other factors which I'll get to in a moment. Um, people were tired of reading about China. So much had been written in the press and so many books had come out, good, bad, and indifferent books, and uh, she never got hers published. Uh, we have a complete draft of it. It was very obviously ready to have gone to some publisher for editing and uh, printing, but uh, she abandoned that. At some point, she decided to switch the focus of her writing to Chinese society and character rather than the Boxer Rebellion. And this new book then drew very heavily on their experiences and the fascinating people that they had met in China. The book is very surprisingly sympathetic to the plight of the average Chinese. Uh, most Europeans and Americans who lived in China in 1900 were critical of Chinese society and reflected the typically racist prejudices that were common in Victorian society. The Hoovers, on the other hand, were uh, typical of the minority of Westerners who found Chinese society exotic, difficult to understand at times, often amusing, but they did not indulge in any hateful remarks about those stupid Chinese or seek to take advantage of the Chinese people. As her new book, Experiments in Chinese Character, made clear, Liu understood and sympathized with the plight of the average Chinese. Her sharpest satirical comments were directed at an American con man who fell victim to his own inept attempts to bribe a Chinese official. She was also extremely proud of Bert's efforts to protect his employees from being lynched by some of their panicky uh, European neighbors. You see, the boxers routinely killed many Chinese Christians and any Chinese who had worked for Westerners. And as a result, a lot of these Chinese had sought safety in Tianjin during the uh, uprising. Some Europeans insisted that all of the Chinese were really snipers and terrorists, and they reported them to the British naval officer who was temporarily in charge of defending Tianjin. Instead of de trying to reassure the civilians, this man began to immediately round up Chinese at random, tried them in an illegal kangaroo court, and shot them. Well, the matter came to a head when two very important Chinese officials were arrested. One was the Minister of Mines for the entire province, and the other, well, he later became the first Prime Minister of China, the Republic of China. Well, Bert tried to intervene and explain who they were, but uh, the British naval officer was having none of it and threw him out of court. And uh, fortunately, the Russian colonel who commanded a large group of Cossacks was much more sensible, and he immediately sent a platoon to break up this illegal proceeding. Lou was still outraged by this 20 years later when she wrote to Theodore uh, in 1920. She did not try to publish that uh, new book, however, because in the meanwhile, Bert had become involved in a court case against uh, his company that he worked for. And the plaintiff in that case, you need to understand, was a Chinese politician who was trying to get himself back into the good graces of the Chinese emperor. So that court case was eventually thrown out. Lou was probably afraid that the British <coughs> press, however, who dearly loved scandal, would portray the book as proof of the fact that the, a poor Chinese could never expect to find justice in a British court. Just look at this terrible book. Mm -hmm. So around the fall of 1903 then, Lou was deciding to try new subjects, ones that perhaps were a little more re related to her professional interests and training. 
This didn't work out very well. She spent several weeks uh, researching the geology of the Red Sea and gold mines of the ancient Egyptians and produced small uh, beginning manuscripts on these, but none of them were published. Finally, in 1906, however, during a visit to the British Museum, she encountered a book that had been written by an important medieval geologist and mining engineer named Georges Agricola. Agricola's masterwork, De Re Metallica, had long been realized as a major contribution uh, in uh, mining, but it had been written in Latin and never <coughs> translated into any other language. Not that anyone, no one had ever tried, but they found a lot of difficulties with it because Latin at the time that Georges Agricola wrote in 1550s was a technically obsolete language. And so whenever he had to describe a new process that had come about since then, he invented new Latin sounding words. I think you see the problem. <laughs> well, Lou didn't see the problem either immediately. Uh, she simply recalled that Branner had told them that this was an important uh, scientific book and it was a pity that it had never been translated. And she saw, or she saw in this an opportunity to make a, pro a professional contribution of her own. However, she failed to realize just how challenging it would be. When it was finally published six years later, in 1912, their joint venture was hailed as a major achievement. In fact, they received a gold medal in 1914 from the Mining and Metallurgical Society of America, America, honoring them for distinguished service to the literature of mining. Lou, however, was just about ignored at the banquet where the presentation was made. Uh, this would have been bearable if she had not published other articles between 1906 and 1914. For example, her article on the Dollar Empress of China was published by a British uh, magazine in 1912, and this was followed by another in 1912, I think it's part of the British magazine published Dollar Empress in 1909. It was followed in 1912 by an article on John Milne, the slightly eccentric father of the sciences seismology. Well, in 19... Things were changing for the Hoovers. Lou had had some success. She had children now, so she had the rewards of starting her family. She was only 40 years old, and it was just the beginning as things would turn out. Around 1912, Herbert Hoover had begun to tell his friends that he was anxious to try something new and more challenging. As he complained to his friends, if he kept working, he would have nothing to show at the end of those 10 years except more money, and that really was not what was uh, of importance to him. Perhaps it was time to go into public service. Lou seems to have agreed with him and began to join various London clubs in hopes of finding some ways in which she could serve. By the middle of 1914, with another major war on the horizon, neither of them had a firm idea of what they wanted to do, but within a few days, that all changed dramatically. World War I began when the Hoovers were on vacation. The British banking system in those days usually would have a bank holiday in August so that everybody could catch up on their bookkeeping. And uh, another holiday like that was coming up when Bert's banker telephoned him and suggested that he might want to draw out some extra money for his payroll and just to have a little extra money on hand, just in case. Well, when both uh, sides in this in war began to uh, issue ultimatums uh, to each other, the Hoovers rushed back to London. The next morning, Bert went down to the office to see how this was going to affect his business operations around the world. The telephone rang. The American Consul General, Robert Skinner, had an office down the street and around the corner, and he was on the phone to tell Bert he had a thousand tourists all lined up in his office and out the door. All of them had been caught in the early confusion of the war. Some had lost luggage, some had lost personal possessions, uh, some had had their steamer reservations canceled, many had become separated from their friends and family, but all of them were agreed in one thing. They wanted Skinner to do something about it. <laughs> well, Hoover heeded the uh, plea and he walked over to Skinner's office and two men talked for a while and they soon agreed that the biggest problem seemed to revolve around money. Many London hotels and merchants refused to accept American money during this early uh, confusion. 
And that made it impossible for these stranded tourists to replace their <laughs> lost clothing, buy a meal, or even rent a room for the night. Then Bert remembered the extra funds in his office safe. He called the office and had someone bring over the money. He then wondered if Lou had extra money in her household fund. <laughs> well, as it turned out, she had about $500 and brought it over right away. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Bert and Skinner had been setting up some tables and began making some small loans to tie people over. Lou and her friends in an organization known as the Society of American Women Living in London also set up a similar organization to supplement the works of the Men's Act uh, Committee. Over half of these tourists were women who had become separated from their husbands and children, and Lou realized almost immediately that they were going to need a special kind of help, and so uh, Lou's committee worked with them. They began also to uh, arrange excursions in and around London to compensate for these canceled vacations, and uh, it uh, worked well for a while until Bert and his friends began running out of money. He had called up a lot of his other friends, and they also loaned money for this. Well, there's only so much that uh, a private group like that can do. Fortunately, about the time they were about to run out of money, the U.S. government finally woke up and provided, they eventually provided about two and a half million dollars in emergency funds, which Bert then used for his work. Years later, Bert would recall in his memoirs that except for $300, all of that money was paid back, all of that. He said it made him proud to be an American. Well, after eight weeks of dealing with human misery around the clock, the Hoovers were thoroughly worn out. Only then was there time to reflect on what they had done. With the help of their many friends, they had organized and administered a large wartime relief organization, probably on a scale never seen before, that had assisted over 120,000 American tourists. They would have very little time, however, to enjoy this uh, accomplishment because there was a larger and much more complicated emergency developing in Belgium. Before the war, Belgium had imported about 65 to 75 percent of its food. When the Germans swept over this little country, the British promptly blockaded Belgium to prevent military supplies from getting to the Germans. Who cares about food for the Belgians? <laughs> The problem was compounded also by the fact that nearly all of the surviving Belgian men of working age were either in two places, in the Belgian army or a German prison camp. And as a result, the entire crop of 1914 rotted literally in the fields for want of someone to harvest. The Germans were unwilling to uh, feed the Belgian population and the only ones who seemed to be able to help at all were American diplomats because we weren't in the war. Uh, the American diplomats in Belgium sent an American engineer named Millard Shaler to London with $100,000 to buy food for the, uh, uh, for the Belgians. And if Shaler's mission hadn't succeeded, 8 million Belgians would have starved because this made people aware in London and also back in Washington, D.C. that there was a major international problem here that only Americans, it seemed, could deal with. And finally, Bert Hoover, of course, offered his services to the American ambassador, who was very relieved because he'd been trying to figure out, well, who are we going to get to run this? And uh, the organization that Bert then assembled came together very rapidly. The man had a genius for organizing things. And uh, it uh, quickly came into uh, being, and it was like nothing that the world had ever seen before. The Commission for Relief in Belgium expanded very rapidly, and eventually, although it was supposed to take care of only people in Belgium and northern France, the occupied portions, um, it eventually covered all of the Allied countries. In 1917, uh, Hoover suggested to Wilson that its job would not be over when the war was over, and that we needed another organization. And this led to the establishment of the American Relief Administration, a gigantic organization that was intended to provide relief for all of Europe during the post-war period. When the ARA finally would wind up its activities uh, four years later, it had distributed food, medical supplies, and clothing valued at over $84 million. That's roughly equivalent to $84 billion today. Well, Lou's experience in China and her work with the Women's Committee and the American Women's War Relief Fund which was an offshoot of uh, her er earlier 
relief organization, had provided her with considerable experience in organizing large organizations, and it had proven her ability to administer them effectively. And these qualifications then would also help uh, to establish her credibility as a, a spokeswoman for the CRB, the Food Administration, and this ARA. And her husband was well aware of these strengths and often used her as his personal representative. Well, someone else was aware of this, too. <coughs> When the Hoovers returned to America in 1917, Girl Scout founder Juliet Lowe was in the process of recruiting an executive board to take the Girl Scouts of America to a new level. She recruited many able women, but Lou's name is the one that began to emerge as the leader of the group. In 1921, she was elected to her first term as vice president, and no one, of course, realized it at the time, but this was the beginning of great things for both the Girl Scouts and the Hoover because she was going to be the driving force that got them there. Consider some statistics. The Girl Scouts amounted to about 92,000 members in 1924, which was much more than uh, Julie Lowe had ever envisioned. But by the time of Lou's death in 1944, there were 1,035,000 Girl Scouts. A lot had happened. Um, there are a lot of factors that uh, account for this. But a lot of it came down to Lou's leadership. She was able to get people on the board to work together. It also had a lot to do with her ability to raise money for various uh, uh, Girl Scout programs. And the Girl Scout programs really helped to make this go. And uh, during the Depression, uh, membership continued to grow. Even though funds were sort of tight, they still had money to get them through, and they were able to adopt their main uh, plan for those years without uh, really having to cut back on the plan. And so through the darkest years of the Depression, the membership rose uh, by an average annually of about 25,000 new girls every year. And uh, Lou, in her, in her uh, own right, raised most of the money that made that possible. Uh, she didn't you know, donate the money, but she raised money from, in the form of grants and loans from other organizations. And as best we can figure out, about $665,000 between 1924 and 1929 alone. And she also managed to uh, get one of those uh, groups that had loaned money to the Girl Scouts to forgive their loan of $75,000. So you haven't had that yet. Well, the statistics are very important, but uh, we really need to move on to the years in the White House. And uh, her satisfaction that she derived from working with the Girl Scouts, unfortunately, could not be said to be uh, the same kind of experience in the realm of politics. Her attitudes towards politicians were similar to the feelings that she had for the press. There were good people in both camps, but they didn't always behave ethically. Her experiences during the campaign left her thoroughly disillusioned. She was especially disgusted at Al Smith because he was the one who really interjected the whole question of religion into the campaign. His campaign was going nowhere, and he sought some, uh, something to catch public sympathy. It didn't work, but it uh, thoroughly uh, disgusted Lou. As her husband later explained in his memoirs, honesty and integrity were very important to her, and it's very important to realize that if you try to understand her way of approaching politics. She was an old-fashioned liberal who believed in an honest debate over real issues, honest reporting rather than lies and propaganda, and fair elections. She did not take a more active part in politics because the way in which the process had become thoroughly tainted, and she had plenty of experience in this before the elections in her dealings and what she had observed of politics in Britain. It did, however, not mean that she didn't understand the issues or that she was unaware of what was going on, or that she was too naive to grasp the meaning of events. In fact, the opposite is true in all those cases. Her letters to her son, Alan, who are full of all kinds of astute comments and observations that reveal a great depth of understanding about many critical issues, such as prohibition enforcement, foreign debts and loans, uh, the notorious bonus march, all of these, and several others. During the bonus protest in 1931-32, she engaged in a number of uh, ways of helping. Uh, another example of stealth philanthropy, if you will. She had the White House servants on several occasions take trays of sandwiches and coffee out to the protesters. 
In some ways, she was not like many of the independent voters of our day who have also become disillusioned for many of the same reasons, I think, uh, with cynical politicians, manipulative political reporting, and all of that. In 1932, she did not sit out on the sidelines, but she accompanied her husband on his last campaign. During her term as First Lady, she also made several precedent-shattering coast-to-coast radio speeches advocating her husband's policies. This was another first. This was the first time a First Lady had access to that technology, and she made good use of it, and she supported his policies. So she wasn't silent. She advocated his position. It was not the position which proved most popular, but she was not silent, as some of her critics have uh, <coughs> inferred. And despite what they have said, about her. She left an enviable record of service in helping to organize and develop several public service organizations. The Girl Scouts are only one. Another one was uh, her founding of the Women's Division of the National Amateur Athletic Federation. That group still exists. It isn't very well known, but it is still a, a professional organization for uh, educators in the field of women's sports. Like many other public figures, she also received a lot of appeals for help from the public. And this first became noticeable around 1918. If you look at the correspondence for this uh, relief effort, of relief work of hers, you notice that. It gradually increased until Burke was nominated for the presidency in 1928. And then the volume of these things picked up dramatically, of course, during the uh, stock market crash in October of 1929. <coughs> For a while, her social secretaries tried to help her with this, but it was too much uh, for them to handle with uh, their, their other duties. And so Lou hired another full-time secretary at her own expense to handle nothing but these appeals for help. The Hoovers were moderately, moderately affluent, but even the Rockefellers couldn't have dealt with this. Um, every letter that she received from 1929 to 1933 received a response. And everybody, except for a few number, a few small uh, group of phonies, was helped. Uh, that, that's reflected in the files too. But probably less than one percent of the, uh, of the uh, appeals were bogus. First of all, Lou and her secretaries would attempt to find a source of assistance locally. If that failed, or if the local agencies had exhausted their resources, Lou would contact one of her Girl Scout friends to pursue the matter. As a last resort, Lou would frequently send money or clothing anonymously through one of uh, these networks that she had. The three things that I think we should remember about this unofficial relief agency, and that's what it was, was that no government funds were ever spent on it, it was very effective, and perhaps most significantly, it preceded the first New Deal agency by five years. <laughs> so much for not being involved being aloof, uncaring. <laughs> Lou's connection with the Girl Scouts overlapped her years as First Lady. Although her new duties faced, uh, forced her to limit her Girl Scout involvement, she did not stop working with the board. This was not the most significant thing about her Girl Scout service, however. As important and as valuable, uh, as successful as it was, unlike Every one of her successors, she is the only one who actually developed and ran a major public service organization for many years. In her case, about 19 years, where she was really running the Girl Scouts. Not only that, but she actually did this simultaneously with uh, the uh, founding of the Women's Division of the National Amateur Athletic Federation. She did that at the same time, and she ran that at the same time. Uh, she spent more time on the Girl Scouts, obviously. But the point, I think, is that demands on today's First Ladies are so great that they can't do that sort of thing. They are asked, uh, they're overwhelmed, really, uh, <coughs> lending their names to one cause or uh, campaign, uh, raising funds, making appearances, and they don't have time to do the substantive kind of work that she did with those two organizations, where she actually ran them uh, for long periods of time. But I think it's important to realize that this is, I think, uh, an answer to those people who uh, thought that she didn't make any real public service contributions. In 1937, the Girl Scout Executive Board asked her to consider running for yet another term as president. 
However, she had already made up her mind to decline several months earlier. There were several things that she wanted to do, things that she wanted to become more involved in, new organizations to run. She was already in the midst of helping to find support for several Republican congressional campaign uh, candidates in the midterm election of 1938. Her last seven years before her death in 1944 were filled with a flurry of activity and the building of still new organizations. Uh, one of them that uh, had a tremendous impact on Stanford's musical program was the Friends of Music at Stanford University. Finally, we should remember that by 1944, the Girl Scout movement was a large, complex organization, possibly the largest service agency in American history, certainly up to that time, and uh, I suppose we'd be hard put to find any other public service organizations uh, of equal size that have come on the scene since then. This organization also should be remembered for having had a tremendous positive influence on the young women who were exposed to its programs and services and values. And of course they in turn contributed as leaders in that organization and in many other ways in their communities in the nation. It has been said that when you work with youth, your public service never ceases because it just gets passed on to the next generation. And if we look at this situation in this way, Lou Hoover's Girl Scout achievement assumes a truly awesome proportion. Thank you.